uh, share information and genes, and that materials will widely exchanged at many different scales. Uh, tonight, what I'm going to do is present the results from the Southwest Social Networks Project, which is a project that looks at social networks at various scales and using um, a couple of different materials. So what I'm first going to talk about um, is uh, networks uh, in general, uh, including some of the basics of social network analysis. And then I'm going to describe our uh, project's uh, goals and uh, data collection. Uh, this project is truly collaborative, uh, although I'm the author of this uh, lecture. Uh, this is the team. It's, real, it's an interdisciplinary team. Uh, the co-PI is Jeff Clark from Archaeology Southwest, uh, seated in the middle. And we have a, a number of other uh, folks who have been help, instrumental in actually writing the proposal and have seen it to uh, this point. And we wrote the proposal about five years ago, so they've been part of the project from that uh, in inception. And those uh, folks include, uh, from the left, uh, standing Ron Breiger, who is a professor of sociology and one of the uh, leading experts in social network analysis. He's the former editor of Social Networks. Uh, next to him, the very tall fellow, is John Roberts, Jr. You may recognize his name because his dad is John Roberts, Sr., the anthropologist who co-authored with Watt Smith, um, Zuni Law. Uh, and then uh, Matt Peoples, uh, who is in the audience and um, has been a postdoc. On the, actually, he joined the project as a pre-doc uh, mm -hmm. informally, and then we hired him as a postdoc. Uh, next to him is Aaron Classet, who is a physicist who was at the Santa Fe Institute and is now an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, peeking out from behind is Louis Bork, a graduate student from the Department of Anthropology, or School of Anthropology, who's not here, unfortunately. Uh, Steve Shackley, who is an expert in obsidian. Uh, Randy Haas, uh, who is uh, another graduate student um, and who has been working on the project from the very beginning. Uh, he's in charge of our database structure and management. Uh, many of you may know Brett Hill, who was with Archaeology Southwest. Actually, he still is with Archaeology Southwest, but he's also an assistant professor at Hendricks College. Um, Deb Hundley is sitting on the other side of uh, Jeff Clark, and Deb is a preservation archaeologist like uh, Jeff uh, with Archaeology Southwest. And then we also have graduate students who uh, were there for this picture. Uh, uh, they include Leslie Aragon, who I uh, uh, Susan Ryan and Megan Trowbridge, and they've all been uh, terrific team members uh, to work with uh, in this interdisciplinary project. So social networking uh, has become a part of popular culture, um, largely, I think, lately because of the invention of Facebook. Now millions know um, many of the principles of social networks. How many people here are on Facebook? Uh -huh. How many people have seen the movie? The Social Network. Do you agree that it was an American landmark? <laughs> Revolutionary and sensational? I actually thought it was really boring. <laughs> but it does mark a watershed, I think, in the popular culture. Another watershed um, is the book by Duncan Watts, uh, Six Degrees, The Science of a Connected Age. Uh, it's really it's a, a very well written book. Uh, Duncan Watts was uh, a professor at the University of or Columbia University. We contacted him to be part of our project when we were writing the proposal, um, but he said he was too busy. <laughs> uh, he had just finished uh, this book a couple of years before, um, but now he works for Microsoft. So he quit his tenured professorship to work for Microsoft in New York City. Well, network analyses have mushroomed in the last five years. Uh, Newman, Mark Newman, who is another very well-known social network analyst, uh, or network analyst in general, identifies four major families of networks, biological, informational, technological, and social. Uh, biological includes things like the metabolic pathways, and there's a food web um, uh, shown here as another example of a biological Informational are citations between academic papers, uh, linkages between websites on the World Wide Web, another example. Technological networks include things like utility delivery networks, computers that make up the internet, 
And then there are social networks, which include uh, analyses that look at, for example, interlocking board of directors. So we might look at interlocking board of uh, Arc and Hiss with other boards of directors, see what we come up with, and you could form a network and see who is pivotal in being a part of different boards of directors. There are friendship networks, uh, disease transmission, which often goes <laughs> through friendship networks, <laughs> and there are exchange transactions, and all of these are uh, very good examples of different kinds of social networks. Now the term, the use of the term network by archaeologists has grown exponentially in the past 20 years. Um, I put this together uh, about a year and a half ago for a AAA presentation. You can see uh, the co-occurrence in journal articles uh, through uh, a search in EBSCO uh, uh, academic uh, search complete shows an enormous uh, growth. I can't believe that there are 6,000 articles with archaeology and networks. That's frightening. Because <laughs> that means that there are thousands and thousands more which don't have a network in them than I'm supposed to be reading. <laughs> and I don't have time to read. Uh, these are uh, uh, examples that um, but only within the last 20 years, but network has been in archaeological parlance for much longer. Now, archaeology is replete with evidence of relations <coughs> that form networks. So, in the Southwest, we have evidence of many different kinds of networks using mineralogical and chemical analyses, for example. Southwest archaeologists have gone to great lengths to analyze procurement and exchange networks. One of the key attributes of being able to talk about exchange is the identification of production areas. And the classic case in the Southwest was identified by Anna Shepard based on the spatially restricted distribution of the raw materials for ceramics, uh, including the temper in the Chuska Mountains. And she was able to demonstrate that the salt-tempered ceramics that occur over 70 kilometers away in Chaco were not made in Chaco, but had to come from the Chuskas. Studies like this refine our knowledge of where many ceramics were made. Other ways that archaeologists talk about social networks is through roads and trails. Inca and Chaco roads, Maya causeways, pilgrimage routes throughout the world, trail systems, and other linear features have all been used to archaeologically document social connections based on these features. Uh, in the Southwest, we have several really good examples of this, Chaco roads being Although, uh, even in the case of Chaco, uh, these may have been religious pathways rather than uh, uh, roads in the sense of um, Inca roads. But these, uh, these networks are great, or these indicators of networks are great when they're available, but they're not very common uh, in the archaeological record. Networks can also be studied through understanding the transmission of material practices. Uh, these communities of practice, or what archaeologists are terming technological styles, indicate shared information networks. Apprenticeship is one of the social networks through which this transmission can take place. Uh, some of the networks were for the manufacture of relatively utilitarian items, but it is a especially powerful way of looking at shared ritual practices. The concept of where, W-A-R-E, in the Southwest, also incorporates many of the attributes that go into thinking about communities of practice, because wares include a constellation of technological choices or attributes that are more similar to each other than to other wares and that were passed down through interaction or transmission. And in some cases, uh, we have new wares that occur or appear or are identified, uh, identifiable because of migration. Uh, such as um, Maverick Mountain series Polycom, that replaced, or were, re excuse me, were reproduced uh, by Kayenta potters on local pastes after they moved to the southern southwest. So at the macro-regional scale, which is the scale that uh, ultimately we're interested in, in using this social network approach, there are several different materials that can be used to look at networks. Um, in our project, we decided to focus on ceramic wares, because these categories reflect the shared technological styles that I was just referring to, especially for the period AD 1200 to about 1550. So what we did is we collected data on decorated and undecorated ceramics, um, 
And uh, in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on the decorated ceramics. Uh, we also collected information on obsidian sources, and this was uh, through Steve Shackley's work, uh, who had amassed a huge uh, amount of data uh, on the chemical characterization of obsidian uh, from sites in the southwest that overlapped with the time period of interest that uh, we were looking at. And then we also added many new samples that he was able to analyze um, at Berkeley before he retired and now in his new lab in New Mexico with X-ray fluorescence. It's a very uh, good uh, material to analyze chemically because it's um, relatively uh, homogeneous within source areas and different sources can be distinguished. So th we thought this would be a really good uh, additional material besides ceramics to add to our analyses. So there, uh, let me talk a little bit about social network analysis uh, in general before I jump into our project uh, data and results. Uh, in social network analysis, we refer to the nodes uh, or, uh, as, uh, or refer to the subject matter as nodes or vertices. And this can be people, it can be uh, households or villages. And in the case of our project, we're looking at settlements or then the connections between them are referred to as ties or edges. And these connections, as we mentioned before, in examples of social network analysis, they can be kinship, friendship, work, uh, but they can also be flows of information or resources. Now, there are several, or a lot of concepts in social network analysis, and I'm not going to talk in too much detail about uh, all of these. But I, I did want to mention some of the terminology because it helps us to uh, uh, look at some of the cases as we go through them uh, in a few minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, we can identify subgroups, so cliques or other subgroups, and you can kind of see those in this particular analysis of the uh, an analyst color coded the subgroups so you could tell the different cliques uh, from each other. Uh, there are high density areas that are more related to each other to other uh, nodes in the network. Uh, some, these are generally identified on the basis of strong ties, but we can also look at weak ties, uh, which are ties that are constructed on the basis of less um, uh, permanent or less, uh, less strong <laughs> uh, ties, things that are, are less common. And uh, uh, our collaborator, Matt Peoples and Randy Haas, have a very nice paper that talks about weak ties and particular uh, brokers. But here's a good example of what a weak tie looks like. So there's a one node that is connecting uh, this particular network, all, all of this network in fact, to this sub-network over here. So if you took that node out, it would be, there would be two different networks. So that's basically a tie that bridges a structural hole uh, creating brokers and also creating um, what's known as the small world effect as, as more and more uh, nodes are added and things become ever more connected. Now, the concept of centrality is very important and here there are some nodes that are bigger than others. Those are nodes that are statistically more central in the network. There are a number of different ways of measuring centrality. I'm not going to go into all of those. But the general uh, relationship of centrality to other things that social scientists are interested in is uh, the relationship of uh, the centrality of the node to social capital or economic capital, something that gives that node an extra edge, so to speak. Uh, there's another term called homophily, and that's the tendency to interact with those who are more similar to others. This has been shown to be true in many cases, and it leads to the expression birds of a feather. So it has been shown in a lot of social science research that um, people tend to want to affiliate with people like them. Uh, and that's what results in uh, friends of friends being part of the network, and uh, also oftentimes a closure of the network where things become more and more similar to each other. The concept of embeddedness uh, is the idea that um, there are more internal ties 
as a ratio to external ties. I'm going to use one example of that here. Uh, Lewis Bork, as part of our project, uh, has been exploring this. And another concept is, in general, that there is expectation that people who are spatially close to each other should be related uh, or uh, interact with each other more than with people who are not spatially related. So all of these come out of the social network analysis literature. There, there are things that are testable uh, that, that we can look at uh, archaeologically to see whether or not they are true or not. And what conditions do they hold up and what conditions do they not? And that's one of the things that I'm going to be exploring. Now this quote from Borgatti uh, is important because what it illustrates is that social network and analysts also focus on the future potential of nodes uh, in, the, in a dynamic network. So as things change over time, the idea is that a node's position will make it either advantageous or disadvantageous to its um, uh, persistent um, or its success in the network. And there are lots of different ways of measuring that. But this is a, actually a really interesting article. Um, Stephen Borgatti is one of the, the main proponents of social network. Okay, so now a little bit about our project. Well, we had several goals. Um, the first one was to apply some of that method and theory that I just referred to from social network analysis to Southwest archaeology, especially to understand the effects of demographic changes such as migration uh, in the late Hispanic Southwest. What we also wanted to do was make use of a large amount of data that had been collected. Um, everybody knows the, you know, the tables of ceramics or the lists and tables of obsidian analyses that you can find in many uh, publications and CRM reports. So we wanted to put that into one database that could then be used for this project, but also for other projects. And then we wanted to contribute to social network analyses in general uh, to uh, provide a case study that's uh, dynamic, that's over a longer period of time than many of the social network analyses that you see. Most of them are year or at most a generation. One of the very, uh, the multi-generational ones, it's a rarity, is uh, Paget's analysis of uh, Venice uh, uh, mercantile families. Uh, so archaeology can contribute to these social network analyses by being able to provide much longer time depth to look at the ebb and flow of the networks. We have an advantage in that uh, a group at the um, Center for Desert Archaeology, now Archaeology Southwest, had compiled a database of all the sites of greater than 12 rooms, dating between 1200 and 1500, and many of you may be familiar with um, these maps. Uh, they were apportioned to 50 year intervals uh, by the dating of the sites, so there are room counts by 50 year intervals. Uh, their database um, included uh, 4,000 sites uh, throughout this area of the Southwest. And what they illustrate is the tremendous amount of demographic change that occurs. You can see the, uh, after 1250, the depopulation of the Four Corners, and in general, the coalescence of population, which leads to uh, the, the Pueblo area uh, in the, uh, or about the time of contact. So what we decided to do was to add to this the Coalescent Communities Database. Uh, so the nodes are all from the CCD, or the Coalescent Communities Database. And what we wanted to do was to build up the ties, uh, decorated ceramics, non-decorated ceramics, uh, and obsidian. I'm only going to talk about decorated ceramics tonight and only one slide of obsidian. Uh, we'll have to get Jeff Clark to come in and talk more in depth about that uh, later on. And then uh, the nodal attributes. So for example, for each one of these sites, uh, we also sought out uh, village size. Well, we have the room numbers to some extent. Uh, we have the, the UTM location, so all of this is in a geospatial uh, database. Public architecture, whether or not there were great kivas, platform mounds, plazas. And then a, a couple of other environmental variables. What drainage are they in? and the distance to other nodes, uh, measured both in terms of straight line distance as well as least cost paths. So how, what, how 
far is it if you were to actually walk uh, the distance? Now, the data collection uh, was a long uh, period, it was about three years, and we placed priority on systematically collected samples, especially screened or systematically recorded surface samples. Uh, we combed published data, uh, including lots and lots of CRM reports. Uh, we got to do a little bit of field work uh, in the blue and the San Francisco River basins using, uh, doing on-site ceramic analyses. We uh, looked at museum archives. There are a lot of counts, a lot of published information on ceramics, or excuse me, unpublished information on ceramics in museum archives. We Xerox tables that were handwritten, uh, tabulations, and then we entered those into a database. We reanalyzed museum collections in Santa Fe, especially, and in Flagstaff. It's actually really great to go up and do that in the summertime. <laughs> and then uh, we also were able to have uh, to get a lot of data already recorded, already in electronic form from many other researchers, and we're really truly indebted to the many people who have contributed. Now, database statistics. Um, well, we decided to carve out one area above the CCD, which is only 334,000 square kilometers. Um, but that is smaller than the full CCD. It's uh, a uh, little over 1,600 sites. Uh, here you can see the, the data. For 709 sites have ceramics, ceramic counts. The rest of them have or have ceramics. Some of them are destroyed. Uh, sites with sourced obsidian, 140. And the total number of ceramics that we have in the database is now 4.3 million, of which over 800,000 are decorated ceramics. And that includes 627 types and 104 wares. So we had to go through and systematically, for every single project, um, come up with a concordance of what people were calling things you know, in terms of their typology and what they um, and the wares that they belong to. And then we have 4,800 4, pieces of sourced obsidian from uh, 34 of the 50 sources that people were using in this area. And I should note that this is the Continental Divide. So it sort of looks like Arizona on steroids. Um, and this is, a, actually it turns out, um, we think it's a pretty good boundary of some sorts, um, a physiographic boundary that does mesh with some social boundary. So, uh, the raw data and pie charts, these are the obsidian, um, distribution of obsidian. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but you can see the color coding on the different sources. And it's pretty clear that people, even at the same site, each one of these pie charts is one site. Even at the same site, uh, people are using uh, many sources, many different sources. Uh, and Susie Fish talked about this from UIR alone, and it's just a really interesting This is, uh, these are the ceramic uh, wear percentages. These are uh, most of the sites, um, it says all sites. I think we added just a few since then. But you can see that there's a lot of variability. On the other hand, you can see some colors of the wares falling out. So there are some uh, areas where one wear might be more predominant than another. But in general, there are multiple wares. This is, uh, these are just the decorated ceramic. So these are, these are what are, constitute our uh, data for looking at our ties. And what we had to do was um, a number of data steps to be able to get to the network analysis. Uh, but one of them was to divide the ceramic assemblages into 50-year periods using the dates for the, the, the ceramic types. Uh, we published our method on this in, in uh, Journal of Archaeological Science. And then we took the wear distributions per period and compared them for every pair of sites and came up with an index of similarity or dissimilarity, depending on your glass is half full or half empty. Uh, it, it was something that was uh, recommended to us by John Roberts, who is a quantitative sociologist and a co uh, collaborator at UNM. But it's also been in the archaeological literature for a long time called the Brainerd Robinson uh, Coefficient. And uh, we publish more detail on this book that's coming out, one of the first archaeological uh, compendiums of network analyses that will be out this spring. And then we identified strong network ties based on the, uh, the 25 most similar uh, uh, assemblages. 
and the weak ties is what um, Matt Peoples and Randy Haas um, have done a lot of work on, and uh, I'm very glad to say that, that their article is now in the press with American anthropologists. And then what we did is we calculate network statistics on the data that uh, come up, such as central. So our questions, uh, just to remind us, uh, are what were the effects of migration and settlement reorganization on network topology or structure? Uh, where and how do the new network, uh, network structures emerge? And what are the network characteristics of persistent or successful settlements or regions? So that's what I'm going to look at. Um, before I do that, I just want uh, to show you these wonderful graphics that Bill Dolly and folks at Archaeology Southwest did just to make sure everyone's got the demographic changes in mind. So here's the um, 1200 to 1250, 1250, and then 1300. See that major change with the depopulation of the, of the four corners, and then the coalescence, especially in the COCOM area down here, and the uh, disarticulation of the north and the south, and then the apparent of people in the South, although I know that there are people in the audience who uh, point out that there are, of course, dispersed um, uh, occupations. Now what I'm going to do is show you uh, the uh, changes at different scales, ch network changes. And the micro scale is the San Pedro Valley. And we took that as a good case study to do because Archaeology Southwest uh, had done a lot of excavation. 27 sites were tested using consistent field methods, lab methods, or, and they knew a lot about those sites, and so my co-PI, Jeff Clark, um, could give feedback on how the, net, the relationship of the network uh, depictions would fit the archaeologist's interpretation of those particular sites and uh, the networks uh, based on other data. So the net, the Cayenta migration is pretty well known for the, um, this area of the southwest, and these arrows from some of Jeff's work show the different places where people moved, including the San Pedro Valley. Um, here are the wear distributions. You can see that there's not an expected clinal drop-off uh, as you move uh, down the network or up the network. Uh, sites that are next to each other don't have the same uh, ceramic. And what does that look like when we put it into a network? So uh, here is a network diagram. And you can see uh, for this time period, the 1250 to 1300 period, that it's a relatively open network. Um, here's the distribution of sites. But the sites are not arranged exactly from north to south, just like you would expect from seeing that previous slide with the variation the most central site is right here, which is Ash Terrace. And if Ash Terrace weren't there, you can see that you would actually be, two, you'd have two networks. It's kind of linking these, these folks together. And Ash Terrace happens to be located right where Aravica Creek comes in. It's the most well-watered area. It's got the best agricultural potential. So this particular site, the high centrality, seems to be related to location in a well-watered um, place. Now, uh, there is a group of sites that are spatially near each other, that in real life, in, uh, spatially, but also socially. Uh, so this group of sites is basically within this circle here. But then there are some odd ones, like High Mesa is over here, but it's over here, and it's in with sites that are over here. So we can see that in terms of the uh, social distance, sites that are near each other sometimes fall into the expectation that they will be socially closer to each other. Now what happens after the period of migration? So here's our 1250 to 1300 network you just saw, but here's what happens with the Cayenta migration into the area. It's a very dramatic change. You've got a very dense network here, Lots of interconnections. It's a closed network as opposed to the more open network that we see here. And the 
there are two, two well-known sites, Davis and Reed Bruin, which are located right here, that are migrant sites. They are the ones with possible, or in this case, documented kivas. And there are a couple of other sites with possible or documented uh, kivas. But these two sites in particular are very interesting because the ceramicists at Archaeology Southwest have identified that these are locations of production of Salado polychromes. So they're the producers, and they're moving in, and they're making Salado polychromes. They're also making some Kayenta-like uh, ceramic, and sharing them with everybody else. So other people who do not make Salado also are partaking and using and consuming and throwing out lots of Salado ceramics, making it into a very dense network. A dramatic change from the previous so we can see that, in part, um, this network, this change, has to be because of mig migrants moving into the San Pedro, making Salado ceramics, and that's what is conditioning a lot of these network uh, relations. So let's bump up a scale, and let's look at the Hocom area uh, in general. And I'm going to go a little bit broader. I'm going to go out to the Upper Gila and into the Tonto Basin. So, we're going to be looking at these regions, which are on this map right about there. So we're going to look at the southern southwest and see how that network changes with migration. I always tell people when I give this talk, pick out your favorite area of the southwest to see how it changes. So uh, if you don't have a favorite, uh, you can pick out which, the Santa Cruz, where we are. Here's Tucson. Here's the, the Santa Cruz area. Phoenix Basin is the red. Uh, Chihuahua Lowlands, uh, sort of a salmon color. So, um, oh, actually, yeah, this one, I might have actually messed this up a little bit. But um, there'll be reminders. Uh, so, here's what happens when we look at that greater area of the Hohokam area. Here um, is the Tonto Basin, um, which is that yellow. Yeah, I did mess up a little bit. That's the Chihuahua is actually yellow. Tucson Basin is orange, Phoenix Basin is red, uh, San Pedro is here. So what do you notice? The network, the social network maps onto the spatial network, right? All the colors are together. So all the Tonto Basin uh, social relations are basically consistent with their spatial location. For this period, this is 1250 to 13. Now, what happens after migration, though, is that you see social relations becoming across drainages much more. So the expectation uh, that that's spatial propinquity should condition the social networks uh, is now um, gone uh, kind of by the wayside. And we have this really big network over here, which is essentially the San Pedro, the Tonto Basin, and the um, and some of the sites in uh, Phoenix and Tucson. But the, most of the sites in Phoenix and most of the sites in Tucson are still maintaining their social distance. So even though the other sites in the southern southwest are much closer to each other, uh, the, these other areas kind of maintain their, their uh, difference. And so does the Chihuahua Lowlands. These are, these are folks uh, who have some Chihuahua polychromes, but they basically define by not having Salado polychromes, which is what defines this big group. So like the San Pedro when seen on its own, at this scale, all of these sites have much more Salado polychrome than do Phoenix and Tucson in this interval. And then in the next interval, Phoenix and Tucson really buy in. So we can really see how the Salado polychrome uh, uh, percentages in each one of the decorated assemblages is making one almost consistent network. There are only a few uh, sites here, and then there are a couple of, um, there are actually there are several uh, kind of outliers that aren't connected to anything at all. But that's because of this polychrome type. And Patty Crown, a long time ago, talked about Salado polychromes um, 
as marking an ideology or the spread of a religion or a social movement. Um, more recently, um, Patrick Lyons and Jeff Clark have talked about migrants maintaining their identity, with, um, their Kayenta identity, by producing and consuming uh, Salado polychromes. And to me, it seems that the, the two together are a really good explanation of why we get this really big network. Because it's not just the Kayenta migrants and their descendants who are consuming these, the Salado. It, it's all the other uh, uh, people at these sites as well. Um, it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. OK, so what happens when we look at our full project area, which includes the northern part of the southwest, uh, above and the Monkey Run Rim and above? So here's the full network data. Here's 1250 to 1300. Uh, we have, and you can see, you've the southern southwest uh, from the last series of slides. But what we have is this giant, giant social network in the middle, which is very different from what's happening in the southern southwest, which is pretty consistent by drainage. Each color is kind of interacting with you know, people um, who are in the same drainage. Uh, but here, it's, uh, Zuni is in blue. Uh, Silver Creek is turquoise. The Mogollon Highlands is the white. Um, the Mogollon um, Sukimogion Rim area is gray, there are a couple of those. Uh, and then these um, uh, are the highlands just north of the Tonto Basin. And you can see all of this is one big interconnected network. But you also notice the size of the nodes. These are much, much larger. These are much more central in the entire network for this time period, for this project area, than anywhere else. No, no other sites are as central as those that are part of this big kind of giant um, component, is what they call it, network analyses. And then you notice the Kayenta Tusayan, which is this uh, bright green, and the Hopi are, are interacting with each other, as you kind of expect, and some Flagstaff sites. Pretty dense network over here. But you can actually see a couple of different, almost sub-networks within this network. And over here, we've got Chaco, Chusca, Mesa Verde uh, you know, interacting, as you might expect. Um, but it's really interesting that there are so few uh, linkages between these different sub-networks. Okay. So what happens with the depopulation of the Four Corners? Okay. So what happens is that giant network made up of Zuni, Silver Creek, Upper Little Colorado, and the Highlands, kind of explodes. And even though they're still living in areas where, uh, that were populated, people are still living in these areas, um, the migration of people from the Four Corners is almost like that meteorite that just hit um, Chelyabinsk, <laughs> which was just amazing. Um, so here you've got this fragmentation. But look at what's happening relatively in the southern southwest. So now that we've got this scale, kind of relative scale, you can see that the southern network is increasing in centrality. Uh, the connectedness we saw with this big component here uh, is um, much bigger than anything else. This is the most central area of the southwest for this time period. There are these sites uh, that are connected to San Pedro, the Tonto Basin, and a few of the other sites. Oh, the Sacker, actually. Sacker is amazingly central in a lot of these um, uh, analyses. What else is interesting? Um, well, you've got uh, Hopi and the Verde are starting to uh, come closer together. Interestingly, Zuni has two kind of networks. There's the main network of Zuni, um, and then there's another network that has um, some affinity with, um, I think it's the Upper Little Colorado in through here. <laughs> And this is actually what you'd expect. If anybody knows Andrew Duff's work, where he talked about how these sites in the Upper Little Colorado that were next to each other had totally different assemblages. And that's exactly what shows up with these, uh, these green. They're really different from each other. So 1300, 1350, and then 1350 to 1400, you can see a lot of change. Again, the bigger network is growing in the southwest. It's feeding frenzy, 
low common area. And then we've got these more kind of more nucleated, kind of you can kind of see that coalescence happening up in the north. Uh, and then 1400 to 1450, big, big contrast. Zuni, Hopi, and then um, one Zuni site. And anybody know what those two might be? Petrified forest, <laughs> right in between. And then here's the, the big, big component, um, 1400 and 1450. So that's, I mean, that's interesting. We can sort of see relatively where uh, sites are more central. But let's look a little bit closer at how much does social, excuse me, spatial propinquity account for social connectivity? Some, but not as much as we thought. Okay, so here's a slightly different way of looking at started a 50 years earlier than some of the other ones. But here we've got the networks are mapped onto a DEM, a digital elevation model. So the shading is the elevation throughout the area. And here the strong connections are coded now for the distance of the connection. The white are closer, tighter, closer networks, whereas the darkest blue are the furthest Linkages. So uh, I don't know if you can see down here, it's got the mega like too low. But these very dark blue are connections that are more than 250 kilometers from each other. So here are very long distance connections. You can see that some connections are very tight. Chuska over here. Chaco was depopulated mostly by this time. Here's Zuni proper, uh, the um, uh, San Francisco. Here's a big cluster here. Here's Phoenix over here. Very tight, very, very close knit. Flagstaff and the Canta area. And then let's look at how that changes. Lots of very long distance connections in the north. Uh, they increase in the period where people are migrating or about to migrate. And then after the period of depopulation in the four corners, you can see how the long distance connections start to build down here. Somewhat expected given what we saw in the network plots themselves. And then there's that big giant Hohokam connection, largely by the Salado Hohokams, but not exclusively. You can see some very close connections building. Um, Tonto Basin, for example, the Verde. And then it starts to disappear, it starts to become less, even though there's still some very, very strong connections here. And here you can see Zuni and Hopi starting to emerge as very close knit. And then 1450 to 1500 uh, are the uh, only the, uh, the polychromes, uh, decorated ceramics that we have uh, indicate Zuni and Hopi uh, left. And this is the 50 years before the Spanish conquest. So, um, in answer to the question, do the networks relate to uh, spatial propinquity? Um, not very much, and it changes in different parts of the, of the Southwest, as you just saw, uh, for reasons that um, we can relate to things like ideology and uh, other factors that are important to people who are living in the Southwest. Um, especially, I'd like to talk about feasting and ceramics, but I'm not going to go into that too much right now. Um, but I wanted to just show you the um, um, obsidian network where we close, uh, and here are what we have done with the obsidian. Jeff Clark and Steve Shackley and, uh, the, uh, and others in our team, they divided, it's very difficult to divide the obsidian temporally. So what they did is a pre-1300 uh, and then a post-1300. And you can see that uh, 13, before 1300 there just isn't much obsidian. That's a very clear pattern. After 1300, there's a lot of obsidian. And what they did in creating this plot was to show um, the um, percentage of obsidian more than expected by distance from the source. So uh, this lighter yellow is uh, much, uh, is higher than expected. Uh, the moderate, uh, the medium orange is moderately overrepresented, and the bright orange is highly overrepresented. So these are all 
more than expected given the distance from the source, but um, some there are some uh, rain and water activities. And so you can see here, not much obsidian, uh, and most of them are light colored, so they're overrepresented a little bit, more than expected. But over here, you can see a dramatic change in that there's a lot of the very dark orange, which is the, um, those uh, uh, pieces of obsidian that are represented much more than you would expect in the distance from the source. But the, another really interesting thing that, that you can notice from this is that certain sources are much widely, much more widely used than others. Uh, just like uh, Susie Fish was talking about at the last meeting, you know, there are some sources that just aren't used that much. Look at the San Pedro sites, for example. They're getting most of their obsidian from Cow Canyon and Mule Creek. So there's a lot more from these sources represented at, at, uh, in those sites. They're not getting as much from further to the west. Um, and remember, from the ceramic network, Phoenix wasn't really part of the network until later in this time period, ceramically. So it seems to hold out with some of the obsidian as well. The other really interesting thing is that the migrant sites in the San Pedro and the non-migrant sites, i.e. those who are the first comers, the hosts, are using different sources. So the migrants tend to like Mule Creek obsidian more than they like Cal Canyon. And you can see that with this distribution here. So there are a number of very interesting things that have come of this, um, illustrating the real differences that have occurred, with, um, especially with migration. Um, just briefly, a couple of other kind of interesting things that we've looked at in terms of persistence. Um, one of the things that we asked was, um, can a relative lack of external ties, um, that's the embeddedness uh, concept that I mentioned before, uh, explain why people migrate? might it be a con contributor? And um, so we've looked at uh, internally focused or embedded regions. This is Lewis Borg's analyses. And especially those that were very low in centrality. Uh, because that might indicate that these were areas that did not have large backup systems. They didn't, they didn't have widespread networks with uh, people outside of their own area. And these would be people who are practicing the principle of homophily in hanging out with uh, people that are like themselves, birds of a feather. So these embeddedness. And I, I wanted to bring your attention. It turns out that the Cayenta Tuseon, which is one of the areas that's depopulated, turns out has one of the highest uh, scores for embeddedness. So they're in, we are internally networking with other people in their own uh, community. They're interacting to some extent with Flagstaff and uh, the Hopi area, but this area, uh, especially uh, the time period beforehand, is pretty distinct. Uh, it turns out that that's also a low population uh, area relative to other areas. So we think that low population combined with the uh, embeddedness scores are uh, in their internal networking and lack of external contacts might be uh, contributing to um, one of the reasons why this area was depopulated. And this area, uh, of course, was um, a lot of the area the south, the southwest was depopulated um, in conjunction with a great drought of 1276 to uh, 1299. So let's see. So um, the other question that we had was, does centrality determine fate? as the Borgati quote might suggest. Um, does the, condi you know, the condition of the node, condition or the, uh, the status of the node, condition what happens to that node later on? And so we looked at what were the most highly connected sites in the Southwest by time period. Turns out that Zuni, for two time periods, um, was at the top of the list for having the highest centrality. Remember those big blue nodes <clears throat> in a couple of the plots? Um, everybody at Zuni will tell you that yes, that's the middle place, so uh, that makes sense. Um, and centrality seems to have promoted uh, persistence in that area. But look at what was central in the rest of the Southwest for the other time period, Safford, uh, the 
Ponto Basin, San Pedro, and these areas did not persist, although they did persist for uh, centuries. They didn't persist into the, uh, the late uh, 16th, uh, 16th century, or even into the 16th century. So um, the Hong Kong collapsed despite having high centrality. Uh, and one of uh, the conclusions that we can come to is that high centrality, um, including a high density of ties, um, might even be called hyperconnected. There might be such a thing as being too connected and too susceptible to uh, changes. And particularly during the time period that um, we we're looking at, at the uh, late prehistoric uh, Southwest, there was a declining uh, population size. Um, and that declining population probably was uh, uh, in part uh, a problem for people who were trying to maintain these very large canal systems. So what we might conclude from this is that centrality does not always equal social capitals, um, or at least not enough to persist for um, forever. And here's a plot of the population for this uh, time period that we've been looking at. You can see how it really does drop uh, during this time period. But the, the, the mean distance among socially connected sites actually went up in the 13, 15, and 1400 period, indicating that it's not all driven by population, that people were increasing the amount of social connectivity at a time when the population was starting to drop. So that's, that's also something of interest in the long term, uh, especially for social network analysts who aren't as familiar with long-term uh, dynamics, such as we have in archaeology. Uh, so what were the network characteristics of what uh, of those settlements that did persist, uh, well, they were very distinct from each other. There was a diversity, uh, as we've mentioned. Zuni was central early on, but wasn't central later on. So it wasn't hyper-connected. So having a, a good balance of, uh, of uh, network uh, links was important for those two areas, like Hopi and Zuni, that persisted into a historic record. So in conclusion, uh, migration was pivotal in reorganizing social networks um, at each of the sp spatial scales that we looked at, micro, meso, and macro. Um, and changing each one of those scales, as you saw from uh, the different series, gives us a slightly different picture of the Southwest. Uh, second, the, the growth of the Southern network in particular shows how social relations can trump spatial propinquity how people in the Southwest were able to do that over um, hundreds of kilometers. And it fits the idea of how migration and ideology shape social networks, uh, especially through uh, Solara polychromes. Uh, third, the network analysis can provide new ways of thinking about some perennial archaeological questions, uh, such as how and why some areas were more persistent. And then I also like to try to make a, a case that archaeological case studies show that some of the expectations of network models may not apply to all archaeological cases. We have to look at that. We have to assess the data, the archaeological data, and not just accept the truisms or the models that are coming out of social network analysis. Uh, because we have different kinds of data. We have longer time periods. We have dynamic networks that uh, can help us. So what's next? Uh, well, we're hoping to extend our database earlier and have a longer period of time, especially for one area of the Southwest, the Chaco area. We already have the AD 1200 uh, to uh, the depopulation uh, in that area. Uh, Zuni is part of that, it's never depopulated. So what we're going to do is take the Chaco um, world database and add material culture to that, and then we'll have a very long time starting at AD 800, uh, centuries of, uh, of change, with the nodes being great houses and great kivas, in order to be able to look at the variability uh, among all of the chakra and great houses and great kivas. Uh, and we'll test whether or not Pueblo Benito was really central, or when it became central to Pueblo. And we're also hoping to look at some great house communities. But stay tuned for that, because that's going to be a few years from now. Thank you.